We're going to look at Matthew 24, 32 through Matthew 25 of 46. This is right after the analogy of Noah. And who are those who are taken away in the Noah model? Who's taken away? Righteous. Is it the good people? The righteous. The righteous are taken away? No. Wait. Wicked, the wicked. Wait, what are we, the what wicked. The wicked. Oh, Until sorry, the flood came that. and took them oh, all sorry. away. So the wicked are taken away in judgment. Okay, so when one's taken and one's left, do you think the ones that are taken are taken to a good place or a bad place? They're taken away in judgment. And so what I want to do, this is right after one's taken, one's left. We're going to follow that line of thought. And you're going to see that there is a line of thought from one taken, one left, all the way up to the actual event. All the parables, including the ten virgins, will point to what we're going to come to in Matthew 25. So, now, at the rapture, is there any punishment? No. 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 No, no punishment. What is it? What did we do at the rapture? There's the, what, seat of Christ? Remember Bema. the? Bema. Yeah, the famous seat of Christ, which means judgment, which was a thing they have in the Greek cities where they made judgments. And that's for what? Counting your crowns. Yeah, for yeah. rewards. Wood, hay, yeah. or stubble, or you know, gold, silver, you know, whatever it is, if it burns up in the fire. But there's nobody that is whipped or cast into outer darkness, anything like that. So when we read a parable about there's punishment when the good men of the house or the master of the house returns, would it refer to the rapture? No. No. <laughs> because according to the book of Hebrews, there, according to the book of Hebrews, a person's will is not enforced until Death. he dies. That's the new covenant. That's where we're saved. So, does the church start in the Gospels? No. No. It's not in the Gospels. Where does it start? Acts. Acts. Acts chapter 2, right? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, it literally says, when the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, as in prophetically fulfilled. Is what the Greek really says. Technically speaking, the Gospels are really Old Testament. What did the Messiah come to present to Israel? Was it the church? <laughs> he come to present the church? No. The church is not in the Gospels, except in Matthew 16 and 18. And that gets into a whole other thing I don't want to get sidebarred on. He mentions it. Okay? The Ecclesia. But what did he come to present? He came to present the Messianic Kingdom. Thank the you. kingdom. Thank you. And when they rejected him, then what happened? They crucified him, and that set up the church, the church dispensation. Open the door age. for the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And which didn't start to Acts chapter 2. So there is no rap. The whole point is this there is no rapture in the gospel because there is no church in the gospel. And technically speaking, the gospels are in the Old Testament. We're going to go to um, Matthew 24 42, okay, through 51. Now, here's the connection, Rapture 42, where he says, you know, about one taken, one left. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord does come. All right, that sounds like no man knows the day of the hour, because there's a connection there. We determined that's not talking about the rapture, it's talking about the second coming. Right. But know this, if the good men of the house, or head of the household, or master of the house, had known at which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken up or broken into. And who's the thief? Jesus. Jesus. Because he's the one who comes. Because in the very next verse, it says, Be ready for in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. Just like the thief is going to come. Okay? Now, he's always spoken of as the thief in, to non-believers. Okay? To people waiting and watching and to non-believers. That's how he comes, because it's his second coming. Now, and they're not looking for him. Even at the end of the tribulation, all that stuff, are they looking for Christ? Not unless they got saved, right? Right. But otherwise, if they're non-believers, he's going to come like a thief. And then he's going to go through there, and he's going to, I'll read the rest real quick. It says, be ready for in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. That's verse 44. <clears throat> Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household <laughs> to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that slave whom his Lord, when he comes, will find him so. He says, Verily I say to you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Okay? Now, when he comes back, he's going to make him ruler over all his goods. What do you think that's a reference to? Because remember, this is just a parable which has 
a real world application. So when we come back to the second coming and there's good servants, he's going to put him in charge of all his goods. What's that? That's talking about us coming with him. It's in it. No. <laughs> the people that are here on the earth when it comes, it is the millennial kingdom. They will get ruling positions. That's his goods, is this earth. He won it back. Just like the book, book of Joshua. Joshua was on a how many year campaign to conquer his land from the usurpers? Seven. Seven year campaign. How long is the tribulation period? Seven. Seven years. So that Joshua is on a campaign, or Yeshua is the Hebrew, okay? And it says, um, and the bad servants, it says, he's going to cut him asunder, appoint him a portion of the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, okay? Then we quickly went to the parallel um, uh, version in Luke, and we found in the intro, he said, let your loins be guarded and your lights burning. What does that sound like? Be ready and mm -hmm. keep your life seven right. Right. Yeah, then he goes into the same parable. And then in Matthew, if you go back there, he goes into the parable of the ten virgins. So we're going to go to that. Okay? Now, um, let's go to Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Remember that weird interpretation I gave last time? Okay, let's go see if it really fits or not. Okay? The parable of the ten virgins. In verse 1. Matthew 25, then or at that time shall the kingdom of heaven be, com be compared like unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, or five were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Remember, I maintained that they had no oil, period. All right? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the br bridegroom tarried, they all slept and slumbered. But at midnight, there was a cry, the bridegroom comes, they trim their lambs, foolish ones say to the wise one, give us some of your oil, okay? But they say, no, we can't go to the marketplace. And then they, they fight, wise one went in with the bridegroom, and the door was shut, all right? And then the bridegroom says to the five foolish ones, he says, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you don't know either the day or the hour that the Son of Man cometh. Again, that phrase, and we determine that refers to the second coming. So let's put this in the context of the second coming. So when the bridegroom comes, who's missing? The bride. The bride. Because in the, in the wedding, Jewish wedding, there were different parts, but the bride's already been taking, taken away, and they've already had the wedding ceremony. Okay. Then they have the wedding feast, and that's where the bridegroom's coming back out to gather a crowd, more people for the wedding feast. All right, everybody got that? Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're going to find out, unless you're post-trib, you have to take that position. You don't got any choice. And I'm going to show you where in Revelation, where you have to take the position that he came and got the bride for the wedding ceremony, and now he's come back again after that. And he's coming to get him for the wedding feast. And it says so explicitly in the book of Revelation when you put it all together. Now, there is something called the partial rapture theory. Anybody know what that is? No. Nobody? The partial rapture theory okay. takes a viewpoint that when the bridegroom comes okay. with the ten virgins, mm -hmm. only five went mm -hmm. and five stayed behind. Right. It's because... Um, they're saying that only half of the church is going to be raptured. Mm. It's kind of like going on, a, getting married, and taking your bride, but leaving her two arms behind, and taking her on your honeymoon. <laughs> Does that make sense? No. And if the whole point is to get the church out of the tribulation period, and it's for Israel, and half the church is left behind, but they're really saved. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense, but you got to take the whole thing out of context. So the partial rapture theory. Is it possible for a Christian to backslide? Sure. I did. I would I would say yeah. Yeah. Okay. But according to Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30, it's called the golden chain of redemption. It's actually guaranteeing each of the different steps. Remember Romans 8, 28? Mm -hmm. 
that famous verse? Anybody? All things work together, together for the good. Yes, all things work together for good. Those who are called to God, those who love God. And then it goes on to talk about those who are called or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And in the Greek, it just guarantees each of the calling. Now, not perfectly, okay? Not, not linearly. You know what I'm saying? Where we just go like this. And some people have had different walks, you know, and it's up and down. I, but I'm just saying, if anyone is truly saved and has the Spirit of Christ, they have the Spirit of Christ, right? If they're truly saved. Right. All right. They're truly saved, that they will be raptured. Now, what we have in the church often is what? Matthew 13. Wheat and, wheat and tares. And what do tares do? Do they look like the wheat? Yes. Yeah. And you can't really tell the difference. In fact, the guy, the owner of it said, well, let's wait till the end at the harvest. And then you can separate the wheat from the tares. Why, why can you separate it then? Because the, the wheat has fruit. And yes. The fruit makes the plant... Heavy bend over, bow down. Bow, bow, bow down. down, right? Yeah, they bow down because the fruit where the tares stay upright. Right. So because of the works that God do in us, we get humbled and we, we start to bend down in humility or the tares stay upright. But they look the same yes. as they grow together. Just look at Romans 8, 28 through like 31 and you'll see the golden chain of redemption. But what God guarantees is a process that would happen. Not perfectly. I wish it was, you know, but it's not. So I would say that, um, you know, right now that God's working in us and that if you're his child, you're his child. You can't unown a child. And that's one of the points in Romans is that God will st stick with you to the end. That's why you're here now. See, salvation is an all-encompassing word. We usually use it for that nanosecond that we go from the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of darkness and translated kingdom of light. I was saved, so and so. Salvation actually refers to also a process throughout our life called what? Sanctification. Sanctification, which is where we become more Christ-like. And it even says that Christ would return bringing salvation with him. Yeah, and he completes the process. Where's the end of our process of salvation? Is, is uh, um, 1 Corinthians 13, where if you read it closely in that, that's the love chapter you get near the end and stuff. It talks about how we're going to be completed at one time. And that's when Christ, we go to be with Christ, whether it's the rapture or whether it's death. So salvation is a, is a lifelong process and it will continue until Christ returns. Then we'll cease from sin. Okay, so salvation though just is is John three uh, sixteen. Yes, the shall believe in him. Yes, exactly. I mean, that sums it up right there. And if you Whether believe in him, what does he give you as a down payment, as a promise, as a pledge? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you're part of what the body, body of Christ. The church. body of Christ. Yeah. And you're part of His bride. Right? Mm -hmm. Period. But, but I think sometimes <laughs> they try to make it so complicated. Yes. Like the Catholic Church and some oh. some other ones, you know, it yeah. just comes down to John 3.16. Yes. It's not it, complicated. It's not at all. But man gets in there with his mm -hmm. system, his tier of things, becomes corporation. you got to go by these rules, do this yes. and that. Yeah. Yes. It just goes on and on. But it's, like you say, Stephen, it's, it's John three sixteen. We could just reduce it to that. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Never yeah, shall believe in Him. Yeah, shall have to ever it. It's, it's, it's believe. Yeah, it's believe, and in that process, once you believe, God changes you, and you're working towards it. Maybe not perfectly, and I'm sure there's periods where we've been lukewarm and falling away. I wish it was, perfect, but like I say, He's moving us towards that, and He's not going to leave us behind. It, it, you know what it is? I just thought of this. Job 2 4. Satan wants to put you in fear. About the deeds of the flesh. Now, the deeds, is that something that you do? Yes. Is it a work you do? The deeds of the flesh? Yeah. Yes. But it also talks about the fruit of the, the spirit. spirit. Now, is the fruit something you do or God does in you? God yeah, just like a fruit tree doesn't force fruit to come out. It's like a but struggle it's between the flesh and the yes. spirit. If you're allowing your flesh to be in power over the spirit, man, then mm -hmm. you are living fleshly, and you're not exuding the gifts of the spirit. 
Yeah. So when it talks about, you know, um, love isn't the main law over your life. You shall know them by their fruits, okay? Mm -hmm. let's, let's look at that one. Is that prescriptive or is that descriptive? Now, here's the difference. Does that describe a true born-again believer versus you got to do this to be born again? You see you see the difference? But you're not doing it. It's the no. Holy Spirit. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's see, by God's grace. Here's so it a is a description of the Holy Spirit being active in Yes. Life. Yes, exactly. So it, it becomes yes, descriptive think, of a Christian. I agree with everything that's being said right now, but I also know people very close to me that use it as a license to sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not okay either. No, no, no. That's very prideful. No, no, and that is absolutely not. And usually... To him who knows what to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. sin. Right. Yeah. So and that's we should very dangerous. Every day. Every day sin a little bit less, a little become bit less. Become more sanctified, yes. become more Christ-like. It's a process. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is. All right. Now, here's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament says, do this and you will live. The New Testament says, live, and you will do this. Hmm. That's why I say, so is it prescriptive Christ or descriptive? Mm -hmm. When it talks mm -hmm. about Christians, it's not like, i got to do this so I can be a Christian and go to heaven. No, uh, oftentimes it's just describing what a Christian is, what he does, because he is a Christian. Okay? So, man, that was a nice um, talk mm -hmm. on uh, salvation. So, teriology is a fancy term. They didn't even mean to. All right. So back to the five and the <laughs> yeah, the five and five. Okay, five and ten. Five and ten. Okay. Partial rapture. So in verse ten, it says, "While they went to buy, the bridegroom came." Now listen to this. They that were ready went in with them to the marriage. The word there is for marriage is gamas. Now I'll say a word. You tell me what it means. Okay. That's G A is polygamas. What do you think that word is? Polygamy. Yes. We said that. Why polygamy? Yeah, polygamy. Yeah, po polygamas. Yeah. Polygamy, which means multiple marriages. You have multiple wives. So, gamas just means our per gamas, which we're going to cover that, which means a mixed marriage. Okay? I'm like, where are you at in Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this, and this is in 2510, for one thing. That's where I am. Okay, but that's the Greek for marriage or wedding. I'm sorry, I should have, I should have told you that. Gamas okay. is is the Greek. Good, you guys, point that out to me <laughs> when I get because I, I already have it in my head, but I don't want to explain it. So that's Matthew, right? Twenty five ten. So when he comes back for the um, gamas is marriage or yeah. Well, it means wedding. Wedding, but. It talks about the whole thing, but it's divided up in the Jewish mind of the wedding ceremony. Actually, it starts with the betrothal period, and then it starts with him going off and coming back for the bride, and then having the wedding ceremony, and then going back for more to have the wedding feast. Yeah. So you got it? Mm -hmm. So uh, all I'm saying here, that yeah. word gamas could be, dependent on the no. context, translate. So I'm saying that gamas here where it's wedding, where he's coming back for the ten virgins, it means wedding feast. And we're going to find, it says that explicitly in Revelation 19. I don't have to guess. And this is getting a little bit ahead of things. I'm going to go to the feast timeline, and we're going to look at it. And this is an amazing discovery. And then we're going to see it in the book of Revelation, Okay. So remember, here it is, that's the abomination of desolation, 1260 in the first half, 1260 in the second. And he comes back on a certain day, same day that it starts, not the same day, but the same feast. Right. It's the Day of Atonement, okay, and just as a little preview. That's not, when he comes back, is that the uh, beginning of the Millennial Kingdom? It's the beginning, right? Right. Yes. The yeah. No, the pre. Oh. Yes, it yes. Every time, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, when I start going like, yeah, isn't it? Then right. you know I'm luring you into a trap. Okay, so if I, yeah, I saw you ready there, Vicky. Like, I'm like, not, not biting this yeah, yeah. time. <laughs> you, you know me well enough. Okay. So what happens is David Tomic, That's the seventh month. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. This is incredible. Tenth day, but he has something to do for five days. Right. And we're going to read it in Matthew 25. 
But the millennial kingdom doesn't begin here. Okay? It begins five days later. There's a five-day period here. We're just going to judge the sheep and the goat. Right. Okay? Because there's no goats in the millennial kingdom when he opens it up. Right. He's got to have that judgment. Now, right here on the 15th day of the seventh month, okay, um, 15th day, five days later, is the what? What feast? Feast of trumpets? No. No. That's Red. No. Feast. Unleavened. 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 No, okay, come on. He's way, but he's in the, the, the yeah. feast of no. tabernacles. Yes. But he's there you it. go. <laughs> okay. I didn't think of what it was, but he's in the later feasts, not the early feasts. Yeah, I'm on the fall feast. That's yeah. the last feast, the feast of tabernacles. That represents the millennial kingdom. Now, now watch this. Okay, that's the millennial kingdom. It's also, remember the millennial kingdom is the seventh 1,000 year, right? Remember the millennial Sabbath theory? I'll get into that later. And how long does the Feast of Tabernacles last? Seven, Seven days. days. Seven days. Now hang on. So right here. So that's kind of weird. Why seven days? I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why. Because... If he came and got us for the marriage ceremony, and that took place up here in heaven, then he comes back in Revelation 19. It says, the bride has made herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. Wait a minute, I thought that was up in heaven. See, you have to be a post-tribber if you don't understand this. No, the, we're, the wedding ceremony is here. The seven-day the seven day, feast... Um, feast is right here because that's exactly seven days and that's exactly at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Does everybody got that? Mm -hmm. I've never heard that ever taught. And I, I doubt if you find that on the internet. It's just like a, a little thing that God gave me. So we go here with the judgment of the sheep and goats and right at the beginning of the millennial kingdom which is the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th, it goes seven days. And I'm telling you, I think that is where the seven day wedding feast takes place exactly during the Feast of Tabernacles because it represents two things God taber tabernacling in with his people for the mill whole millennial kingdom and for that seven days the actual feast is happening it's a wedding feast where he's tabernacling with everybody in the first of all uh, what does that word mean? Yeah. Tap what? what does the word mean? Tabernacle. oh it's a tent it's a tent, it's a tent. In okay. fact, John 1, 14, okay, it says that the word, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and, and the word was God. Then you go to verse John 1, 14, it says, and he dwelt among us. That word for dwelt, if you put it in the Hebrew, is tabernacled. Mm -hmm. So the first tabernacles was when he came into this world, which is why I think one of the possibilities of the day he was born is maybe tabernacles, Okay. The others pass over, but I won't get into that. This is a preview of the feast template. And I'm telling you, when you put things in the feast template, mm -hmm. everything comes to life. Everything makes sense. Everything fits. It's just ridiculous. I know the exact day of the abomination of desolation. And I know why the Antichrist does the abomination of desolation on that day. How would I know that? Because it's exactly, and this is what starts it. Day of what? Atonement. Yeah. At one minute, right? Day of atonement. And it also, if it starts on there, it's going to end on that day, right there. Right. So and if you go, and it's exactly three and a half years to here, which you could just say half a year. And the funny thing is, the feasts are in the first month and the sixth month, exactly half a year away from each other. Isn't that funny the way you work that? Okay, but anyways, so, so everybody up to me, this is the abomination. So you got that, Elisheva? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's that timeline. And of course the rapture is happening where? Right here, right? Ten days. Ten before. days. Ten days before, right? So that's what month and what day? First day of the seventh month. And day of atonement is the seventh month, tenth day. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's where it's going to end. Mm -hmm. So if I, and I did give you a quick preview, if I just jump six months ahead, mm -hmm. what does that take me to? Mm -hmm. Seventh month. Right? Because mm -hmm. it starts, no, excuse me, first month. Mm -hmm. Okay, first month. tenth day. Mm -hmm. That's exactly six months ahead, right? So you're going mm -hmm. in increments of five or what? 
No, of six okay. months. Because it's three and a half years, you just take take out the three years and make it half a year to get this date. Mm -hmm. I, just trust me on that. <laughs> trust me on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go, <laughs> I'll go a bit more thoroughly when we get into the feast template. So I know that he presents himself as God, as the Messiah, on the tenth day, right, mm -hmm. of the first month. Mm. Why is that important? Because that was the exact day, Zechariah 9, 9. You know, behold, daughter of Jerusalem, your king comes to you, lowly, monk, mounted oh, on the so that's donkey. The, that's the day that Jesus mm, presented himself yeah. to the nation yeah. as the Messiah. Yeah. Which is why that's the exact day that... Yeah. And he also overcomes the two witnesses, kills them then. And then, you know, when they're resurrected, you know what day that is? Huh. Passover. Mm. Who's the Passover about? What two main characters besides Jesus himself? Who? Elijah. Yeah, it's Elijah and Moses. <laughs> and that's who I'm saying the two witnesses are. You see how it all fits together? So let's go. Let's ju jump ahead to right here. <clears throat> all right. So at the rapture, Jesus. That that's the rapture. I should have learned how to write that. I never got to. Ten mission words. That's the rapture. And from here to here is what. The wedding, the gamas, ceremony. Ceremony or the feast? Ceremony. No, no, not the That's feast. That's what he's telling the you about the feast later. later. Yeah. This is the actual. Is this is the ceremony. In heaven? Okay. Yeah, seven yes. years. Because we're there. We're seven in years. The bride's in heaven. The bride. Because remember in the parable of the ten virgins, no bride. Why? Because he's already gotten the bride, and the bride has been raptured right here. Where he comes back for the ten virgins is right here. You mean the other five? The, well, yeah, for the five. There's a total of ten, only five get in. Mm -hmm. Now, what feast is that? Which one? Well, is it, it comes a feast right here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Day of Atonement. If it starts on the Day of Atonement, if you go exactly seven years, 360 day years, and remember I told you, seven I think days. it's going to go back to that. Mm -hmm. seven days. Mm -hmm. It will be on the Day of Atonement it ends. Now, that's the what now without looking at that. So what day will he arrive back on the Jewish calendar? The third so month, se seventh month, first day, first day. day. The seventh seven. month, first day. So the seventh month. Okay. Now seventh month, first day was ten days before. That's a rapture. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. a seventh oh, month, what? That's why I'm saying fifth day. day. Tenth day. Fifteenth. Tenth day. Tenth day. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> this is good. This is working. <laughs> this is working. <laughs> Hang on. I know he's saying. Why did he ask us? Okay. Now. I know. Now we kind of got all that. Okay. We kind of. Yeah. I looked at my watch. Oh, you know what it means? Oh, oh, I'll oh, forget. I'm like I'm a good joke. <laughs> okay, five days right here. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the beginning of the millennial kingdom when he comes up. Again, people get that. They say the rapture that begins the tribulation period. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Then say anyway. It's when Daniel nine twenty seven, when the Antichrist enforces a covenant with the many, mm -hmm. the days enforced, because that's the seventieth week of Daniel. Mm -hmm. That's how we know the start of it. And then they say, well, when he comes back, the day he comes back to the millennial kingdom, and logic would tell you that, right? No. There's a five-day period because it actually starts on the seventh month, right? And what? Ten days. And the no, the tenth days of when he returns. Five days later, so fifteen, which is a feast. Feast of tabernacles. Yes, feast of tabernacles. Okay. And how long is that? Seven days. So what's he missing out of the wedding? The feast. The ceremony. Yes. And how long is the feast? Seven, seven days. How long is the Feast of Tabernacles? Seven, seven days. days. Seven. So I'm telling you right here for the next seven days is going to be a wedding feast to inaugurate the Millennial Kingdom. And just like Gog and Magog is just right at the beginning of the New Heavens and New Earth, I think Gog and Magog is right at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. So I think it's going to be somewhere in this area. Okay, so personal opinion. It, it, it's not lining up in my head. So we okay. have we have the Antichrist comes on the scene after the rapture. Rapture yeah. first, Antichrist, Antichrist, three and a half years of uh, peace. 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 He's he's he, he's resolving and solving but wars the and rumors problems. of wars. Yeah, there be some before, stuff. Yeah, and that's where he gets his authority. He gets his authority from the world because he comes up with these plans to bring peace to the earth. Right. 
Everybody right. says, yeah, that's a great idea. Everybody wants to follow him. But he's still not the one in charge. The Antichrist okay. is still not in charge. Not until the yeah. midpoint. He has enough power to, Daniel 9.27, to enforce the covenant with the many. The many is nine, Daniel 9.24. You know, Daniel, this prophecy is for who? Your people and your city. Your right. holy city. Right. So, he he has enough power. So, somehow, after the rapture, I think it's going to, you think it's moving quick now. After the rapture, it's going to be supersonic speed. So this guy is going to be able to rise up in this 10-day period. And that 10-day period is actually called a certain name. And we're going to get into all that and break it down. But in this little period right there, he's going to rise up and have enough power to um, enforce that covenant. But who's in charge during the first half? If it's not the Antichrist, who's in charge? The ten toes. Uh, yes! The ten toes of Daniel 2. Mm -hmm. The ten horns... Okay, of Daniel 8 and the ten horns of Revelation 13. And then he ten kills kings. three of them. Yes, and it's right here where it says, according to Revelation, man, I'm giving you guys a big preview. Revelation 13, it says the devil gives his power and authority to the Antichrist for how long? Mm -hmm. 1260 days. Yeah, that's why he's years. able to come to overcome the two witnesses who prophesy. For 1260 days. But it's got to be right here, right? Right. Because they can't do it when he has the power and authority of the yeah. devil. Right. So is that is that kind of mm -hmm. making sense now? Falling in place a little bit? Uh, and, and you know, it's funny. When Yeshua was growing up as a little boy, he could go up on the hill right by his village. Nazareth. And you know where he looked over? Nazareth. The valley. The valley. valley. Har, Megiddo. Har, Megiddo. Yeah. Or the valley of Armageddon. Right. You can see it. And can you imagine that? Now, we think of Jesus, I'll do this quickly, then we'll stop. Uh, we, we think of Jesus as, well, he's God, of course he knows the word, but you know what? He came as a man. And usually it was the Father's responsibility to teach the Son, which I think is the way it should be. Now, here's my question. Who taught Jesus? How do you learn the word? Joseph. Like Joseph. Well, according to the book of Isaiah, I think it's 51, he it says... He studied with the, the rabbis. Nope. Mm -hmm. in, in the they said, hey, he didn't go to our schools. Yeah. Okay. But he knew more than them. They were oh, yeah. perplexed so, that he knew more than them. But he had to learn as a human. It says in Isaiah, I think it's 51, I could be wrong, it says, he awakens me morning by morning. Mm -hmm. He has given me the ear of disciples. Mm -hmm. His heavenly father actually woke him up early in the morning just like a regular father would and taught him the scriptures as a man as a boy mm -hmm. he wasn't like see we tend to think well he was god he learned it right or he knew it already because he was the word and he wrote it no he had to learn it and it was his, get that from? huh isaiah 51 uh, I'll, remind me afterwards okay yeah he awakens me morning by morning so kind of a and then he could go up and see the valley of harmageddon <laughs> Right out there, okay? Um, all right, so the last thing, no, okay, that's it. So you, you kind of see this nifty little feast template. More to come on that. Mm -hmm. We're going to fill that baby all in until your head is spinning. Well, once we start the tribulation period, don't we know the exact date? And I'm going to repeat that about 50 different ways, but that's like me saying, we'll know the rapture on the way up. I can tell you when the rapture is on the way up. Right. Right. Yeah, I, on the way up, of course I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, see how that's kind of cheating <laughs> for me to say that? Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's cheating. It's you not fair. You know that. Yeah, you already know that. Why do we study prophecy if this stuff after the rapture is irrelevant? Why should we waste our time? Well, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures is fire God and prophetical teaching, reproof, the reproof, correction for training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. All scripture, okay? But also, Revelation 19.10 says what? It's the spirit of prophecy. Yes! Yes! Is the testimony of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So I want to know everything I can. And it, you know what it tells me? He's got everything wired. Everything is lining up. Everything is there. And he reveals his secret, or his sowed, to his people. Remember, part is sowed, the mystery. He reveals it to those who are his own. Okay, so what is the purpose of the tribulation period? Anybody? Well, he just told you. It's in Daniel. It's Daniel. To put okay, it so, I mean, if you look at it and really break it down, it's to punish sinners, pour out his wrath on the world, and, but mainly, is to bring his, the wife of Jehovah, the father, whom he divorced, 
back to repentance and be restored unto his wife. Don't get that mixed up with the other stuff, which is his son, Yeshua, as a Gentile bride, which is different from the divorced wife of Israel, or divorced wife of Jehovah, which is Israel. One's the church, one's Israel. Does that make sense? 